stuff. But this is what I wanted to just kind of share in, in a picture, is picture this white sheet over here as Adam and Eve in the garden with God. All right? There's no sin. And remember what God did, how he created Adam? Anybody want to help me out here? Out of the dirt. He, he just formed Adam out of the dirt. So you and I are made of dirt. Sorry, I hate to insult you. Um, we had Ed Silvoso come through and said, no, men are made from dirt. Women are made from men. So women are twice refined, and men are mudheads. <laughs> so they took a rib out, right? God took a rib out, and the, another guy said, well, well, does that mean they're boneheads? <laughs> Woo! No. Women are not boneheads, and men are not mudheads. We're made in the image of God. So this was a beautiful scene. This is what God's will was to be in the garden. Perfect communion. They were naked and unafraid. No shame. But then what happened? Sin. Upside down world. And we all know what that's about, don't we? And you know, when you're flying a plane upside down, you don't know it's flying upside down. Because something with the gravity while you're up there, they think that's what happened to Robert Kennedy Jr. Yeah, he was flying the plane upside down when he crashed. Because when you pull up on the wheel, you think you're going up, but you go right down instead because you're upside down. And this is the world today. All right, the, the world's flying upside down. If I could just tell you. And that's why we need a savior. All right, so the dirt got defiled by sin. And what does sin do? It separates us from God. That wasn't God's plan, was it? And what did the devil say? Do you remember the serpent when he was lying? The first lie was, did God really say? Ha! That hasn't changed. He's constantly questioning God. And he's constantly trying to get you to question the character of God and say he can't be trusted. The reason he told you not to eat from that tree is because he doesn't want you to know what he knows. You're not going to die. Then they ate from the tree, and they didn't die. Hmm. Was God lying? Say no. You could always say no to that one. And you never will. You'll never fail. And you never will. But the devil's a really good liar, isn't he? So even though they didn't die when they ate it, they brought death into the garden. And the wages of sin is, right, we all know that. And we've all seen it, we've all experienced it, because anybody who's alive has sinned. Whether it was intentional or unintentional isn't the issue. It's factory installed. When we're born, we have sin. And we need a savior, and we can't save ourselves. Thankfully, there's been somebody who came and lived this life named Jesus. See? And because of his blood, we've been forgiven. Right? He, he had to live those 33 years. And, and if you think about it, he put the world right side up again. Because he was dirt, but he didn't sin. So he's the only person that made it all the way through life. Now, I know some of you might wonder about babies and all that. I'm talking about somebody who grew into the age of reason and understood what sin is about and in every way tempted just like we were, but no sin. And then he put the world right side up. So here's where we live because he hasn't come back yet. So we live in this zone where we have accessible to us the Holy Spirit, but that we still have to make a choice about who we're going to yield ourselves to. And, and the ultimate goal is for God to give us, when, when he comes back again, we'll have the full measure of, of what, he ha what Adam and Eve had back there in the garden. But we live in this place of how are we going to do it? <laughs> Which one do you want? <laughs> Upside down or right side up. And this could be flipping around all day long, couldn't it? You start out great. You start out in the morning. You're praying. Then you get cut off on Route 3 on your way into New York. There's big demons when you get past Giant Stadium, I can tell you. 
I used to live there. So, so am I covered by the blood? But is there still a gorilla inside me that wants to come out of the cage? Oh boy, there's a little bit of stress going on here. Who's going to win? Jesus or the gorilla? My inner linebacker wants to show this guy what a forearm shiver is. But the Jesus in me wants to say, you were just singing a worship song when he cut you off. Why don't you bless him? He must be in more of a hurry than you are. Why would you let him steal your joy when the joy of the Lord is your strength? Don't give him that much credit. He's not that good. He can't steal your joy when you're in me. I'm not that good to flip it up and make it land like that, but you get my point, right? This is it, like back and forth. Which one? Where do you stand? What's your firm foundation? It's got to be the Word of God. But see, like the Holy Spirit peace is just so crucial to all of this because what happens is we tend to, we get tagged as being legalistic, right? And that's what the purple kind of represents. I'm not being political now with red and blue and purple. Forget that for a minute. And just think about the blood. Yes, the blood covers you. But you've also got that old nature tries to resurrect. I know we quoted it. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. But can that old man still resurrect? Right? You ever heard that expression about having a monkey on your back? Yeah. And anybody that went through 12 steps knows this one, right? What do you do? You starve the monkey. But, but when you get mad, you give him a protein shake. <laughs> See, you don't want to feed the monkey. You want to starve the monkey. That's what Jesus said. You got to crucify your flesh daily. Oh, you can't crucify yourself either. You need help. That's what Chin was saying. You got to be in a body because you can nail your feet and one hand in, but how are you going to get the other hand up? You got to have help. You can't do it alone. So this is a big challenge, isn't it? Because anybody here ever get everything right every day? So, okay. So, I mean, it doesn't mean that God's mean. It means that we have to say, like Jesus said, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but without him, I can do nothing. That's what Jesus said. Without him, I can do nothing. I, I only want to do the things I see him do and say the things I hear him say. And, and that's not as much fun, we think. Way more fun than living with the wages and the paycheck of sin. Because that's not God's paycheck. God's paycheck is blessing in the obedience. And this is where we live. But let me just tell you that if I had another stool, I'd put it over here. He's coming back again. And we're going to be over here. And that's going to be everything that Adam and Eve had in the garden, but more. Because we now will rule and reign with him for eternity. And that's not everything we always think about. We just think about when we die, we get to make the cut and we get into heaven, which is certainly better than hell. But we don't realize we're going to get a new body. We're going to have a version 2.0. Oh, no pain. Bring it on. Bring it on. New nature. What we have the nature now, if we're choosing to receive Holy Spirit, but it just doesn't happen automatically. And this is why some churches grow when they teach what we call sloppy grace. I don't want to insult other churches. I really, really don't want to do that. I'm just saying the Apostle Paul was probably the best example we could look at of somebody who was, was a hardcore Christian. He grew the church, and he didn't compromise. And sometimes he looks a little rude. You know, he's confronting Peter who was a big shot in the church and doesn't care. It's like, you know, you're, you're backsliding here. You're, you're going back to the old way. You can't do that. And, you know, he'd rather speak the truth, yes, in love, but speak it than just try to give people sloppy agape. It's not nothing sloppy about it. This wasn't a cheap price that was paid for you. He gave it all. So is it too much for him to say, give me all? If you want all the blessings, be obedient. 
And you're not going to always be because you don't have, you know, you don't have to be an Einstein to be a Christian. But we, we perish because we don't have a vision, but we also lack knowledge. So a good church will, will keep you wanting to know God's will. But a, a religious and, and stifling and death-filled church just, just causes you to get rigor mortis. And it's so stiff, and, and the vision just, just gets crushed because religion kills. The word without the spirit kills. And, and that just can't be us. And I'm saying this as somebody who married a prophet and, and was not understanding the, the value of that prophetic piece of our lives as much then as I do now, having lived with her for all these years and meeting so many other pr prophetic people. And I can tell you that that's part of that religious spirit is losing the edge of the prophetic. Because I'll, let's just be honest, I'm not meaning to insult anybody, but by nature, we tend to be a little lazy mentally. We like to put everything in a box and check the box. And then the men, you know, the, we go into our nothing box. If you ever saw that analogy, I won't go into it now. But man, let me tell you, God loves us being engaged with the assignment that he gives us. And, and he's less concerned about our natural gift as our willingness to do what he tells us to do. And it's awesome that it's almost like he purposely does things to show that it couldn't be us in our own natural ability. <laughs> it had to be him. So as you think about what they had in the garden, what they lost, what we have back now if we want it, and then this ever-growing, being transformed into the image of God with ever-increasing glory and allowing more red and less purple and taking off the old nature. This is not a strip show. I'm not doing a stripping here. Uh, it's biblical. It's biblical. Take off the old man and put on the new. And whenever that old one tries to resurrect, you just crucify it again. And Jesus said, you got to do that every day. Something's going to try to come up. All right, you ready for scripture? All right, good. Second Corinthians. I'm just going to stay in Second Corinthians 4 and 5, and then you can be with your family and eat what you eat on Easter. Second Corinthians 4, 6 says, The God who spoke light, right? The God who spoke light into existence, saying, Let light shine from the darkness, is the very one who sets our heart ablaze over here. <laughs> now, how many Christians do you know that you could say, their heart is ablaze. How many would like people to say that about you? What a great, what a great description. Their heart's on fire for God. And they don't get it all right every time, but they're sure trying. There are men and women after God's own heart. Nobody's perfect. Nobody gets, gets all A's on every test. But that's another way that religious church just stifles people because it's all about shame and condemnation and just calling out the sin and I won't go off on that tangent, but look, I'm not saying we don't have to speak the truth. We do. But boy, don't forget that you've been forgiven. We don't pull rank on each other. The greatest title is serve, right? So not I'm up here, you're down there. No, we're all in this thing together. Nobody has arrived. So their hearts are set ablaze to shed light on the knowledge of God's glory revealed in the face of Jesus, the anointed one. Think about that. So you have his character living on the inside of you if you yield to it. But when the purple wins, it's not the, the, the light of God inside of us. It's that dark light. And Jesus said that, remember? He said, if the light in you is darkness, what does that mean? Does that mean you could have a dark anointing of evil? That's what predators do. That's what, that's what people who, predator, who are predators over children, that they wait and they seduce kids for sex. That's the dark light shining. They don't know Jesus. Why don't they know Jesus? Because maybe we're not getting out there and telling enough people about it. Instead of blaming the sin in the world, well, what are we doing to change it? And I, I sure don't like the idea that they're going to teach my kids and five-year grandkids, five-year-olds, that they can choose whatever gender they want. That's not, that's not lined up with the Word of God. 
Sorry. This beautiful treasure is contained in us. Look at somebody and say that. The beautiful treasure of God is contained in you. That's good and bad. Well, just you could say that too. That's good and bad. <laughs> because why? <laughs> Crack pots <laughs> made of earth and clay. So can we just be honest with each other? Nobody here is better than anybody else. We're all cut from the same cloth. Some people have a, a blazing heart for God. And I say get close to them and, and pray it's contagious. And let you be blazing fire for God too. But you never fully arrive. So it's not like you can ever pull rank on people and say, well, I know all the answers. Imagine you get to heaven and confetti starts falling when you get through the gate. Finally, the first person who got every point of doctrine right. Me? Sorry, I wish, but no. They're probably going to be like, <coughs> do you remember what you said on March 4th, 2002? No. <laughs> Probably good, I don't remember. But look at it. Oh, this beautiful treasure is contained in me, little old me, this cracked pot made of earth and clay. So that transcendent character of this power, the resurrection power that's alive in us, will be clearly seen as coming from God and not from us. That'll keep you humble, won't it? <laughs> Forget the Easter eggs, okay? Forget the chocolate bunnies. This is way too important of a day to not understand. This is the key to living right for God while we're still here. We're going to heaven when we die. You know, if you're saved, you're going to heaven. Awesome. But don't live this lower life form while you're here. Live for the fullness of everything he has for you because when you're squarely in the will of God, doing his will, you'll never feel better than right there. You'll know that you're making a difference. And really, it could be a life or death situation for the people that you're talking to. Never been a higher suicide rate in America. You could be the difference. Now, don't get guilty and, and throw that all on you. That's the devil accusing you. What you do is ask him every morning before you go out, give me the ability to see the opportunities that you give me and then step into them even when I feel less than fully qualified Anybody ever feel less than fully qualified to do what God asked you to do? Well, you notice all the hands going up? So do you just not do it? No, you step out in faith. Get out of the boat. We are cracked and chipped. It's this one, right? Even though we're here now and we're on this side of the cross, we're still cracked and chipped from our afflictions on all sides. A Christian can be afflicted, but we're not crushed by them. We are bewildered at times. Oh, boy. Right? The last two years, been bewildered about anything? Yeah. And prior to that, too. But we don't give in to despair. Who wants you to give in to despair? Go back upside down. My wife, oh, I don't know. Do you remember the name of that movie we saw? The girl, uh, uh, the guy, the Christian guy married her out of that scene. Anyway, we... Redeeming love, I gotta, I'll recommend it. Now, I'll, I'll give you the caveat that she, uh, the girl in the movie was lost her parents and was sold into sexual uh, prostitution, slavery in, in, in America. So, you know, beware of that, okay? There's going to be, there's nothing openly terrible about it, but there's a lot of implications of that. So I'm just warning that. But, like, every time this guy that, that ended up marrying her out of that place tried to show her love, she couldn't receive it. There was so much hatred for herself and, and so little image of what the right way to live was that all she could do is go back to what she knew and start drinking again and, and going back, and he would keep going and getting her. And then I won't ruin the movie for you, but it ends really well. But it's a picture of all of us, I think, in one way or another, that we believe God in a million other areas, but then there could be one stronghold where we really have a hard time believing that, that we could get a breakthrough in that area. And that's where the Wednesday night teachings have been so good, talking about deliverance and the strongholds and how to overcome the strongholds. Giving in to despair is what people do when they're in a lot of pain 
and they don't know there's an answer to the pain. And I only knew this from the last two years, but they said that some people that did take their own lives said the reason was at least the pain was going to be over. What does that mean for us? That, that we can be given good news. You can be out of your pain. There's a God who loves you unconditionally. It's not good advice. It's news. He's alive. He's alive. You'll be filled with the Spirit of God. You won't have to give in to despair anymore because you'll have a new nature inside of you. Get in, get in a church with people who will love you and, and endorse you and validate you and pray with you when you're feeling like you have to give in to despair. We are persecuted, but we have not been abandoned. We have been knocked down, but we are not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the reality of the brutal death and suffering of Jesus. As a result, his resurrection life rises and reveals its wondrous power in our bodies as well. Boy, there's a lot I could say. But think about when you're out in the secular workforce and people know you're a Christian and you're not preaching at them, but they watch how you handle situations and they know there's something different about the way you're handling it. And, and it's usually the thing you don't do that they expect you to do. So somebody gives you a hard time on the job and the other people are just like really going after them with their mouth. And they're really talking bad about them and shaming them. And you're not. Because you got a different spirit in you. You're, be, you're being work, you off of, your algorithm is the word of God. And you remember when that was you. And look, nobody here is perfect, right? You don't have to be. You just have to try to be like Jesus. He helps you. That old nature rises up. He doesn't condemn you and say you're disqualified. You just get to retake the test. Anybody here ever have to retake a test? Yeah, I don't like retaking tests. I'd rather learn the first time. For while we live, we are constantly handed over to death on account of Jesus. Now, does that sound like a real amen, hallelujah kind of verse? What kind of church would talk about this? You're here. It's actually good news. It's actually what Jesus was saying is that crucify, pick up your cross daily. I love you, so I want to show you what needs to go today. And the things that happen to you, you think it's a devil. Maybe it was just God so that that little area that was still in your heart could be revealed and you wouldn't have seen it otherwise. Now, I'm not, I'm not making him, you know, the bad guy here, but he'll use it. He takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it around for good. Because it's an evil world, we might get tempted to avoid all evil, but the light belongs in the darkness, not just always with other Christians all the time. And just because I say they're Christian, baby, they might be the wrong type. Judgmental and legalistic and rigor mortis. That's what dead bodies do. They get stiff. And we don't do it that way anymore. Right? I don't want to live like that. I want to be pliable in the hands of the Lord. And man, let me tell you, there's just something a little bit on the side, but Young people can teach you so much about you. I didn't know that when I was younger. I never thought that the older generation would benefit from anything I could bring, but it's so important that there's three generations. And instead of looking down at young people, you need to speak life into them, and you need to realize they know something you need to know. And, and boy, young people, could, if you're under 21, could you stand up if you're here today? I'm not going to make you come up here. We're not going to put oil on you. We're not going to do anything weird. Oh, there's a bunch. Hallelujah. All right. Now, you are the future for all of us, okay? We need you to flourish, every one of you. We don't want anything bad to happen to you. We want you to flourish, and we want you to learn everything that God wants you to have. And, and when we grew up, we had to go to the library. If we wanted to find something, we had to go to the library and pull out a, 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 a draw about this long, and we had to pull out a little index card, and we had to go figure out where the book was at like 14 miles away down that hall, and that was one book. 
What if you needed three books? You got it right in your pocket, the whole thing. So have a little patience with us because you go way faster, way faster on that, all that than we do. So we got the gray hair, that could help you, but you know how to use technology and that could help us. And we want to learn from you. So now you guys could sit down. Thank you. Everybody else, can we just say that we haven't always treated the young people with the respect that they were due? And we're sorry about that to all of you. And as I got older, my own sons were teaching me things. And, and, and it was like, I don't ever remember my dad ever telling me once that he learned anything of value from me. <laughs> he probably learned some things, but I don't know if it had any value. And here I am, like that investment that I made, I love my children, I tried to invest and sow my life into them. It's being returned to me in amazing ways. And it's so cool to see your children as adults and to see who, who they turn out to be. And, and they, they're speaking into my life in ways that they don't even know, and, and that's how it's supposed to be. We can't be like we know it all, because nobody does. And, and, and it's, it's our obligation to take what we know and give it to them in a way they can understand it and use it so that they'll flourish. Because you start messing with people's kids, and mama bear comes out, right? So you gotta do everything you can do to help that next generation to flourish, right? You gotta be more than a conqueror. The conqueror is the one who takes the spoils. More than a conqueror is the one who goes out and helps other people take the spoils and who gives the spoils to the young people and says, this is what you need to do. So we don't just conquer. We're not just saved for our own good. We're saved so that we can pass on the kingdom to the other people. Amen? All right, that was my little rabbit trail. I need more red. Get some of this purple out of the way. <laughs> We're constantly handed over to death on account of Jesus so that his life might be revealed even in this weak, purple flesh of mine that's not fully sanctified. So death is constantly at work in us, but life is working in you, Paul says. Jesus' death is the means to new life for others. Offer yourselves up as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Hmm. When believers suffer for others, as Jesus did, God's life, I'm sorry, their suffering is an avenue for God's life to transform situations. So many examples that I could think of, but you remember David Wilkerson, the guy that wrote Cross on the Switchblade? Tremendous man of God, right? So he didn't know what he was doing. All he did was see a Life magazine and had a picture of a bunch of kids in a gang that were on trial in New York City. And he drives from Pennsylvania, wherever he was in Hicksville, Pennsylvania, and he goes to New York thinking he's gonna go to the trial. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? He didn't have a clue. He didn't know anything. He goes into Harlem driving his car, and I don't know if it was Nicky Cruz he was looking for, but you know Nicky Cruz is part of that story. And he pulls into, I don't know where he was, in uh, maybe 163rd, you know, somewhere up by the George Washington Bridge. And he pulls over and he says, hey, do you know where Nicky Cruz lives? <laughs> Right? Like, how many Nikki Cruises were there probably at the time? Thousands. And, and the guy on the street goes, yeah, he lives right there. Right? I mean, like, what are the odds? Billion to one. But when God was directing him, he took that piece that was inside of him that wanted to see these kids chain. I don't know how many 60 years ago that was. We're still talking about how God used this guy from the middle of nowhere who knew nothing but he, that God told him to do something. Isn't that beautiful? Other people's lives changed. And, and Nikki Cruz told the story that David Wilkerson would say, God loves you, Nikki. God loves you. And Nikki would say, I'm going to cut you in a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson said, that's fine. Every one of those thousand pieces is going to say, God loves you, Nikki. God loves you, Nikki. God loves you, Nikki. <laughs> that was just right on, the, right on the fly. See, he couldn't have prepared that. And then Nikki Cruz is trying to sleep, and all he could picture was a thousand pieces of David Wilkerson 
God loves you, Nikki. God loves you, Nikki. And he went, stop doing that, man. Don't do that. I can't sleep at night. And he got saved and ended up being this massive minister for revival. Because one guy was willing to be a fool for Christ. And he was. And, and, and be the first one to tell you, you don't always know what you're doing. But that, that's why it's called faith. You have to step out of the boat by faith. You're not going to always know. Their suffering, right? When believers suffer for others, as Jesus said, their suffering is an avenue for God's life to transform situations. We share the same spirit of faith as the one who wrote the psalm, I believed, therefore I spoke. <laughs> so when we first came out here, people would ask us questions about the church. They'd say, so uh, what are you going to do for, uh, for, for a building? And we would say, I don't know. We're looking. Um, where are you going to meet? I don't know. We're looking. Um, how are you going to work your job and also teach? I don't know. So I started calling it the I don't know anointing. I had the I don't know anointing. When you plan a church, you have the I don't know anointing. And it says that about Abraham in Hebrews. It says he went not knowing where he was going. How does that make sense? How do you go when you don't know where to go? Because God told him to go. And you have enough faith to step out and trust God that he's going to show you where to go, right? I believed, therefore I spoke. So we also believe, and that belief leads us to acknowledge that the same God who resurrected the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus. Say it. He will raise me. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in me. You need it. That's really good news. Tell somebody near you that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in them. Oh, and if it's not, we'll pray. Woo. Man. The same God who resurrected the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus and usher us all together into his presence. All this is happening for your good. As grace is spread to the multitudes, there's growing sound of thanks being uttered by those relishing the glory of God. Chin did that for us today, right? You didn't hear him when he was in the 10-year period of, of trial, but, but you could have because we were, we were like, oh, my God, like Trisha said, like, they don't ever complain. They always seem happy. Like, we know what they're going through. Horrible accusations being sent against them. But by faith, how are you going to do it? I don't know. I got the I don't know anointing. But I know God will never fail me. He never will. Never will. So we have no reason to despair. That's one of those easy to say, not so easy to do. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your trust in God. Despite the fact that our outer humanity is falling apart and decaying, our inner humanity is breathing in new life every day. Somebody's spirit could be young, even they're in an older body. Amen? That's what I want. You see the short-lived pains of this life? They're just creating for us an eternal glory. That's over here. See? This is where we keep our eyes on the prize. Yeah, while we're here, you know, I get victory every time I yield to the red over the purple. That's how I get to live today. And when I do this, other people get blessed by that too. Ultimately, version 2.0 body over here, no gravity. You start to realize as you get older, gravity is not too much, not too much fun. Starts pulling things down that used to be up. I'm going to leave it there, I promise. I'm not going any further than that. You see, the short-lived pains of this life are creating for us an eternal glory that does not compare to anything that we know here. It's creating an eternal glory on that side when we come, rule and reign with him forever. So we don't set our sights on the things that are here that we can see with our own eyes. All that's fleeting. It will eventually fade away for what we're going to get. Instead, we focus on the things that we cannot see, which live on and on. Verse 5, I'm sorry, chapter 5 now, just a few more to go. We know that if our earthly house, that's this body, which is just a mere tent that can easily be taken down, is destroyed. 
We know that, right? I mean, it's going to happen. We, we, we dedicate babies, we marry people, and we also do memorial services for them. And you can't help but realize, it's going to be me someday. Unless he comes back, that would be fine. I won't complain about that. But if not, the mere tent is going to easily be taken down and destroyed. We will then live in an eternal home in the heavens, a building crafted by divine hands, not human hands. Currently, in this tent of a house, we continue to groan. Sorry, that's not a negative confession. I'm just reading the Bible. We groan and ache with a deep desire to be sheltered in our permanent home. Because then we will be truly clothed and comfortable, protected by a covering of our current nakedness. The men have been focusing on a book by Jack Frost called Experience in the Father's Embrace, and then another book that we started called Transforming the Inner Man. And hasn't it been good, men? Those of you that are in, in the study, make some noise, please, so they know that we're really doing it. And uh, a lot of it is uh, taking on the true identity that God gives us, not what the world says about us. Amen? And that's not easy, because men don't have an easy time experiencing the embrace of the Father. Because that looks like weakness to guys, right? Prayer looks like weakness to guys because it looks like we're asking for help. And we're drilled all our lives that asking for help is a sign of weakness. So you don't ask for help because you're supposed to just figure it out on your own. And we're going through all this stuff. But deep down, when we, when we put our head on the pillow at night, we know that we're not everything that we could be. And that's what he's saying here. We want a covering for that nakedness that we're aware of, for that shortcoming that we have. We're going to have it then, but he gives it to us now when we understand that we're covered in the blood. Right? We're, we're his sons. We're not perfect, but we're perfectly loved. And perfect love casts out the fear of being naked. Verse 4, the fact is that this tent, in this tent, we anxiously moan fearing that naked truth of our reality. What we crave above all is to be clothed so that what's temporary and mortal can be wrapped completely in life. Amen? Let it just, just, just let it sit in for a minute and say, I can have this now. I, I can, yeah, you don't have to repeat it, but I'm just saying you, could, you can understand a greater knowledge of the Father's love for you now is going to give you the confidence to operate in spite of the flaws in your life. Because you don't have to be perfect to follow God. Aren't you glad about that? It would disqualify me and my wife, as close as she is to perfect, but we're not there. He's not asking you to be. He's just asking you to be on the path to grow into him. I'm finishing up now. The one who has worked and tailored us for this is God himself who has gifted his spirit as a pledge towards our permanent home. All right? He's gifted us his spirit. When Jesus died the perfect sacrifice, 50 days later, Holy Spirit came down. You have Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. It may not be fully manifested yet in, in speaking in tongues. We'll pray for you to have that happen, that experience. We'll pray for you to have that. They did that in the Bible. They laid hands on people, and they got filled with the spirit. Why wouldn't you want that? It says in Corinthians, when you pray in tongues, you're speaking to God. Who wouldn't want to speak to God? But don't be a lesser than if it hasn't happened yet. Just keep pressing in for it. Amen? That's the down payment. You've already got what you're going to have in fullness. You've got it in part right now. What are you doing with what you have? Looking at pornography is not a gift of the Spirit. Just saying. Jesus didn't see his father doing that. So some of these are pretty easy tests. That doesn't mean it's easy to fight that temptation. But just know that he wants you to fight it, and he gave you the tools. Fast and pray. Ask him, in my weakness, Lord, I need your strength to come in and fill me. That's what he said. He got this gifted his spirit to us as a pledge, a down payment towards the permanent home that we're going to have. In light of this, Oh, isn't this good? We live with a daring passion. I think we should stand. That's a pretty challenging phrase, isn't it? <laughs> live with a daring passion. I mean, I hope somebody would say that about me if they really knew me. 
I remember getting convicted when David Torres shared one time on Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and he went down all the attributes, and he said, when somebody reads that, do they think of you? <laughs> love is perfect. Love is kind. I, I, I'm like, oh, man, Dave, why would you have to say that, man? I don't think they do. <laughs> And this is the same thing. In light of this, we live with a daring passion. That's how Paul lived. He's the one who wrote it. He's like, when we know that all of this is just a temporary mess and that he gave us the tools we need, and I got my eyes on that prize, I know what it's going to be like for eternity, I'll do whatever I have to do for the remaining years of this life to make sure I go down swinging. I'm going after the enemy for this purpose. The Son of Man was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And we know that our time spent in this body is also time that we are not present with the Lord. Ho, oh, the path, it says in verse 7, that we walk is charted by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. Amen. Could you say it with me? I walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you, Lord. Can you just lift your hands? Lord, we're grateful for the truth of the word that resides in us. When we know your word, when that truth is resident in our hearts and mixed with the power of your spirit living on the inside of us, it's a dynamic duo. And as weak as our flesh might be at times, we don't have to give in. Give us the daring passion to go after everything you want us to have. That's the kind of people we want to be, Lord. We don't want to be mediocre. We don't want to be lukewarm people. We want to go after everything that you have for us. And today's a good day to focus on it. Because it's the day we remember you defeated death. You defeated the wages of sin. You defeated the hopelessness that we had by giving us a picture of what it's going to be like for eternity. So while we're here, Lord, keep us busy about the Father's business. We want to be busy about your business and fully able to fulfill the calling you place on each one of our lives. More red and less purple. Cover us under your blood and protect us and keep us, Lord. Let us be those ambassadors that you've called us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you all very much. There might be somebody here who doesn't know the Lord or somebody who's watching online. We just want to take a minute because if you're not sure what to do, it's not that hard. You probably saw the movies of the crucifixion of Jesus, and there were three crosses. He was in the middle, and there was a thief on either side. And one of them looked at Jesus and said, if you're, if you're who you say you are, why don't you save yourself? And the other guy said, don't say that. We belong here. He doesn't. He's innocent. And that guy said, remember me. Remember me when you get to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That man never went to church. He never got baptized. He didn't ever get to read the Bible. But he said, Lord... So that's what we do. We just say, Lord, I don't have it all figured out, but I sure want to try because I'm in a lot of pain and I need help. And you'll get help from the Lord. You'll get help from a healthy church, whether it's this one or find one, and, and watch what the body of Christ can do in action. So if that's you and you haven't ever said yes to the Lord, we'll just say a prayer. You invite the Lord into your heart right now. It doesn't have to be any religious thing. It's just you talking to God like a father and saying, I need help. Amen? So say it like this. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I recognize I have sin in my life and I can't save myself, but I want help. I don't know how to help myself. Sounds like you want to help me. And what Jesus did gives me life if I receive his life. So I trust you, Lord. I want to receive your life, your forgiveness, your spirit, and walk in that relationship as a child of God. I receive you, Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Make me obedient to you that I could live a life of abundance in the earth and eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So 
one way or another, everybody in here made one of those prayers and said, come into my life. Uh, and if you, got, if you did that and he met you, could you make some noise right now? Let them know that it's real. Yeah. Thank you. We'll work on your whoo, but that was pretty good. So all that means is don't be bashful. If you said that prayer, come up to the altar. Take a step of faith. Do something in public to say, I'm leaving that old way behind, and I'm going up there, and I'm trying this. I'm going to try something new. Trisha said, I'll give you a year. Like God was really threatened by that. He met her. He met me. He met everybody here that's hollering and hooting now. You're no different. He doesn't like one person more than anybody else. So the altar's open. Come up if that was you and you said that prayer. Come on up. If not, you all, I love you. Have a great day. I appreciate being able to lead this flock. Have an awesome Resurrection Sunday.